Welcome to the book of Matthew chapter 20. This chapter has a unique parable in it that we're going to get into. This is the parable of the hiring the people for the workers for the vineyard. This parable does not exist in the other gospels, basically. This is a unique one to the book of Matthew. Now remember, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. So he's going to put things in here that are going to make more sense to the Jewish communities than the non-Jewish communities. Uh, but let's look at this parable here. Verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder. So a householder is somebody who owns a house, has land, they have assets, and they need help taking care of them. Which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, this might not sound like a lot in our day and age. A penny a day sounds terrible wages. We have to understand that that's not quite the same as their wages back then, basically. But it is a small amount. So he went out and he found people hanging out, not, not doing anything. He's like, hey, do you guys want to work? I'll pay you if you come help me in my vineyard. And they're like, okay, great. They agreed to a penny for the whole day's work. Okay, awesome. Verse 3, and he went out about the third hour. So if he's in the early morning, and then he goes out several hours later to get more. And he says, and I saw others standing idle in the marketplace and, and said to them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. So he went out at least four times so far, to find laborers, okay? So the first laborers have been laboring the most, the longest time. And then these laborers are get, each progressive group is spending less time laboring in total. Uh, let's see, in verse 6, And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. So he's hired early in the morning, then a couple hours later, then a couple hours later, then a couple hours later, and then a couple hours later. So we've got five groups five cohorts of laborers he's hired. So the ones that were hired first have spent the longest time laboring. So here's what's going to happen with this. Verse 9, they And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. So the people who were hired the latest got a penny. Verse 10, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. So as he paid them, he paid them in the reverse order he hired them. So he paid the 11th hour people a penny, paid the rest a penny. So these people who worked from the morning, they spent the most time. So the amount of time each group worked is different, but they all got paid the same amount. And so in verse 11, and when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, because these are the people that started in the morning. And they said in verse 12, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. So they're going, what's up with this? Those guys worked for a whole hour. We worked the entire day. We worked through the hot sun. We worked through the, all the other stuff that was going on. We did more labor than they did. Why did they get paid the same as us? Now, this is an interesting thing to think about, okay? There was a psychological study done. Uh, I, think it was, I think it was at Harvard. Uh, they did a psychological study. They brought college students in, and they said, hey, we're going to give you a job. And they, they ran a job application form. These kids came in. They didn't realize they're part of a psychological study. So they told this these kids, we're going to give you a job and we're going to pay you $15 an hour. Just I'm just throwing that out there. We're going to pay you $15 an hour. And they said, oh, okay, that sounds good. 
but we are going to also pay your friends, five of your friends, $20 an hour to do the same work. Do you still want the job? And they denied it. They wouldn't do it because they would be making less than everybody else. Then they brought another group of students in and they paid them $10 an hour. But they said, we're going to hire five of your friends. We're going to pay your friends $7 an hour. And they said, great, we'll take the job. So here's what's fascinating. They were presented, in fact, I think it was actually the same group of kids presented two employment options. They picked the lower amount because they perceived they would be better off than their friends. I'm being paid, I'm being paid less here than here, but I'm being paid more than my friends. So it's a perception. People sometimes have this perception of, I need to be better than the people around me. I want to, I want to be up above everybody else around me, basically. And that could be what's happening with these guys here. They're going, I worked more, so shouldn't I be paid more than them because I put more effort into this? So that's what they're saying here. Now, verse 13, Christ comes, the, the not Christ, excuse me, the husbander, the householder says, but he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? So he reminds him, when I came and got you that morning, you agreed to do the work for the whole day for a penny. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We said a penny would be fair for the whole day. Okay. So verse 14, take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. So he says, look, you and I agreed in the morning, you're going to do a whole day's work for a penny. We agreed to that. That's fine. That's fair. I'm not cheating you at all. I'm following our actual agreement we made this morning. It doesn't matter to you what I pay everybody else. Don't worry about that. So we have to understand that sometimes we think we should impose our ideas on others. Okay, I see, I saw this, uh, there was a, there was a, a lecture uh, that uh, I read the transcript of. This guy gave a talk about financial management, and uh, uh, I read the written version of it basically. And as he's when he was up on stage speaking, he made a he 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 kind of paused what he was doing. He said, "Hey guys, hold on a second here. I'm I missed breakfast this morning. I'm really hungry. I'm running on empty here, and I need some food. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who has some food I can buy?" And one person raised their hand and he says, yes, what do you have? And they says, well, I've got a bag of pretzels. He says, great, I love pretzels. Will you come up on stage? So this audience person grabs their bag of pretzels, which is already open. They've been, they've been munching on them themselves. They bring this bag of pretzels up on stage. And the guy says, yes, I would like to buy that bag of pretzels from you. And he pulls a $100 bill out of his pocket. And he says, I'll give you $100 for the bag of pretzels. And the, the, the audience member's like, sold, we're, we're, yes, take the bag of pretzels. I want the hundred bucks. And he says, okay, great, thank you. You can go sit down now. So he sends the audience member to sit down with his hundred bucks. So this guy's on stage with the bag of pretzels and he starts eating a couple of them. He's like, oh, these are great pretzels, thank you. Then he turns to everybody else there and he says, now how many of you here believe that that was an unfair transaction? And a whole bunch of people raised their hands and thought that was unfair. That, the, that a lot of people were thinking that the audience member took advantage of the presenter by selling him. I mean, he probably paid five bucks for the bag of pretzels. He didn't, you know, he could have, he could have, the, the presenter could have paid 10 bucks and the guy would have still made 100% profit. So this gentleman, this presenter brought this up and he told these people, he says, look, he says, here's the thing that's important for you to think about, okay? And he turned to the audience member that, that he gave the hundred bucks to, and he asked them, are you sad about our deal? Do you want to take it back? Do you want to change our deal? And the guy's like, no, nope, I'm fine. I'm okay. I want, I'm, I'm happy with my hundred bucks. And the presenter says, I'm okay with it too. He, that the, the, the audience member wanted the hundred bucks more than the pretzels. The presenter wanted the pretzels more than the hundred bucks. They were okay with that transaction. 
So then he turns to the rest of the audience and he says, the rest of you doesn't matter. If he and I are okay with our transaction, the rest of you, it doesn't matter. Stop imposing your ideas on our transaction. It was our transaction. If we're okay with it, your opinion doesn't make a difference. So that's similar to what's happening in this story. Now, if we think about this story from a financial perspective, that's kind of what's going on here. There's more going on with this story, of course. So in verse 15, let's continue on. So this is the husband or the householder, excuse me, saying, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So just because I choose to pay my other guys equal with you, even though they did less work, what's it to you? What does that matter? Is, are you going to get offended and have negative thoughts, which is bad? Are you going to turn evil because I'm trying to do something good for somebody? I have my reasons for paying these people the same amounts. You and I fulfilled our agreements. Nothing's been wrong for you. So that's, that's kind of what he's saying here, basically. Now, this goes into a deeper, again, discussion, a deeper conversation on things. But let me, let me read something first from uh, Jeffrey R. Holland. I love his talks. He's got great talks. Uh, and he made a comment on this one. He said, this parable, like all parables, is not really about laborers or wages any more than the others are about sheep and goats. This is a story about God's goodness his patience and forgiveness and the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a story about generosity and compassion. It is a story about grace. It underscores the thought I heard many years ago that surely the thing God enjoys most about being God is the thrill of being merciful, especially to those who don't expect it and often feel they don't deserve it. However, Late you think you are, however late you think you are, however many chances you think you have missed, however many mistakes you feel you have made or talents you think you don't have, or however far from home and family and God you feel you have traveled, I testify that you have not traveled beyond the reach of divine love. It is not possible for you to sink lower then the infinite light of Christ's atonement shines. That is such a powerful thought to think about. <clears throat> there is no dream that in the unfolding of time and eternity cannot yet be realized. Even if you feel you are the lost and last laborer of the eleventh hour, the Lord of the vineyard still stands beckoning. His concern is for the faith at which you finally arrive, not the hour of the day in which you got there. So if you have made covenants, keep them. If you haven't made them, make them. If you have made them and broken them, repent and pre repair them. It is never too late so long as the master of the vineyard says there is time. You can find that in the Enzyme uh, May 2012. <clears throat> so it was a conference talk in April of 2012. It's a beautiful phrase. So this is this metaphor idea of, look, God is, is hiring all of us to do great work in his kingdom. He's hiring us to do things for him. And he's going to reward us equally if we do what we agreed upon with him. So this changes the concept of what we think of as equity, okay? In a economics or a financial standpoint, some people might say, well, even though the first people agreed to a penny, maybe we should pay them more because they worked more. Now, the penny was still seen as a fair wage when the contract was put in place. They agreed a penny is acceptable for a day's labor. So when the people from the 11th hour worked one hour and got a penny, they had they felt like they they had won the lottery they're like whoa this is great this guy is generous this is nice he is merciful to us that's great now why were they there in the 11th hour not working we don't know what led them to be available to work at these different hours maybe those that worked in the 11th hour have challenges and problems maybe they're the bottom of the barrel of employment 
which is why no one employed them all day long because no one was willing to hire them because they didn't think they were worthy to be hired. So the, the Lord of the vineyard hired them for his labor and then paid them fairly and equally with everybody else. So it doesn't matter where we start on the path. It doesn't matter how long it takes us to get there. We all have the same reward through Christ at the end. That is cool. That is really cool. Christ's grace, Christ's love, that abundance for us will be equally given to us. That is amazing. Such a great quote, such a great thing for us to think about. Now there is another perspective on here too, in verse 16. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Many be called, but few chosen. So these are two other ways to think about this metaphor. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. In the scriptures, we've heard that. We heard at the end of the last chapter, in fact, that that phrase was used. There's an idea that talks about that the Jews will get the gospel first, and then the Gentiles will get it second, which is during the time of Christ. They had it through the Old Testament. They had it in Christ's time. And then after Christ dies, the Gentiles get it. In the last days, the Gentiles will get the gospel first, and then the Jews will get it second. Thus talking about the idea of the fulfilling of the times of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are going to have a space of time allotted for them to have it. They'll have the chance to accept it, and then eventually their time will be done. And then the gospel will be given to the Jews to do more. That doesn't mean suddenly Gentiles are kicked out of the church and then the Jews are converted to it. But it means that the Gentiles who have made that choice to join the church will, and then the Jews will join them in the church. Whereas those who don't, it's, you're going to have to go figure it out on your own. Like missionary efforts will change, all that stuff will change, where it's not as actively promoted. And you'll have to find it on your own, basically. Uh, so that's one way to look at this. The idea of many are called, but few are chosen, kind of gives you this idea of not, not predestination, but for ordination. That people have been called and prepared to do certain things. But that doesn't mean you're, you're being chosen because your efforts in being worthy helps you to be chosen. There's lots of people who can fulfill a calling, but someone who's, more, who's done more preparation work can be chosen. So there's opportunities for us. There's talents given to us. There's things that are given to us so that we can fulfill the work of God. But our agency determines if we are chosen to do that or if we're not. It's up to our agency. So let's live up to the standard that God has given for us in our life. Uh, verse 17, we're going to switch on the story here away from that parable. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them. So he's pulled his disciples separate from the rest of the crowds to talk to them. Verse 18, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. So this is Christ telling his apostles, okay, we're on our way to Jerusalem. That's our next stop. But realize when we get there, it's going to be different. Here's what's going to happen. I want you to be prepared for what is going to happen. Now, if you're following the chosen, this is kind of the end of season four, basically, of, of this. This is Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's preparing his, his apostles to realize, look, guys, things are about to change. It's going to get bad. Things are going to get crazy. And I'm going to leave you for a while. But then I will come back for a, a time. <clears throat> so he's preparing them for, I mean, could you imagine if they just walked in Jerusalem and all this happened and they didn't have that preparation? Oh man, it'd have been crazy. It'd have been way chaotic for them. But Christ is preparing them. He's helping them. So that's, I think that's a good idea to look at the rest of us too, is Christ prepares us. He's helping us to make the next steps, to make the changes we need to make, to move forward in our spirituality. If we listen to the Spirit, We'll understand it. 
So verse 20, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So if you, again, if you're watching The Chosen, this is Zebedee's wife basically coming in here. Uh, now what's interesting is in Mark, this story is different. In Mark, it's the two brothers who ask Christ, not the mother that asks Christ this question. Uh, so here's the question they have. And again, if you're a fan of The Chosen, you'll probably be thinking about what this was like in that time. Verse 21, and he said unto her, what wilt thou? So he's like, what is it that you would like? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Verse 22 is Jesus' response. But Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, so this would be the brethren saying this, we are able, because this is interesting to look at. So Christ is going, are you sure you want that? Do you realize what kinds of sacrifices and punishments and challenges you have to go through to get that? And they're going, oh yeah, we're ready. We're ready. We believe we can do it. We're ready to go. I mean, you got to give them points for enthusiasm in wanting to follow Christ and be so close to Christ that they're literally sitting next to him in the kingdom of heaven. So they think they're ready. They think they're there. Uh, in fact, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained that the phrase drink the cup of the cup was a metaphorical expression meaning to do the things which my lot in life requires of me. He explained that the phrase be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with means to follow my course, suffer persecution, and be rejected of men, and finally be slain for the truth's sake. That's in his book, Doctrinal New Testament Commentary. This would be interesting because if they, this would be so fascinating if like Christ said, come here, let me put my hands on you guys' heads. Here's what I'm going to go through. If he put in their mind a vision of what he had to go through, if they saw that in their mind and went, and then he took his hands off and said, are you guys ready to do that and experience all that? They probably would have went, nope, we're not ready. <laughs> we're not ready. Nope, nope, we're good. You're good. We just, we're, we'll, we'll follow you. You take, you take the lead in that. They probably would have pulled back and went, no, we're not ready to go through that kinds of suffer and torment. Holy cow. So verse 23, Christ is continuing on here. And he says, he saith unto them, ye shall do drink indeed of my cup, meaning you're going to experience similar things than that what I do, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So realizing that they, they, they're thinking Christ's can make whatever choices and decisions he wants. And he goes, no. Who sits next to me in the kingdom of heaven is up to my father. I'm doing his will. I'm not doing my will. It's his plan. It's up to him to decide. You have to take it up with him if you want those seats. I'm not the one that's to give that out. That's not my authority. That's his authority. That probably, they probably went, oh, okay. Well, we didn't fully understand this, apparently. There, there's more to this than we thought. Uh, now, it's interesting in verse 24, and when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So the rest of them are like going, what are you guys thinking? Are you guys like prideful or something, full of pride? What's, what's the deal here? That was, that was a stupid thing to ask of Christ. They were a little upset. And some of them might have been upset, like, why are they trying to get better than me in the, in the kingdom of heaven? You know, judging themselves against each other. Uh, and, and this is kind of interesting to look at. So if we look at the life of James and John, these are the sons of Zebedee, also given the, the nickname the sons of thunder. Uh, we, we know that James, this is, so if you're following, again, the chosen, this is big James. We know that uh, James later on is killed by a sword 
from oh uh, um, rats. It's a Roman Roman leader. Um, dang it! I, I just man, his name is like right there. But anyways, he gets killed by a ruler, basically a Roman ruler. Kills him with a sword. Just <laughs> runs him through. Kills him out. So that's how he's going to die. Uh, they're going to suffer persecutions. They're going to be locked in jail. They're going to have other problems. John, on the other hand, he gets boiled alive. He gets thrown to wild animals. He gets starved. He gets all kinds of things happening. But because of a special blessing he gets later on, we'll see in the New Testament, he doesn't die. So he's not dead yet, technically. We'll get to that story here in a little bit. Uh, but they are definitely going to suffer some serious stuff. Uh, verse 25. So he's, this is, so this is the savior kind of bringing all this conversation back. And he says, but Jesus called them unto him and said, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them. So he's, he's saying, guys, the world has this power dynamic that they do to try to think of, I want to get ahead of everybody else to have power over other people. Verse 26, he says, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. This is someone who waits upon or serves other people. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. So these verses are where Christ describes the role of deacons or priesthood leaders, basically. They were to be servants to help others. So you have to realize in the world, it is believed that the people are there to serve the ruler. But in the kingdom of heaven, the ruler is there to serve the people. The, pe the least of the people are the ones, so we invert the power dynamic, basically. So the people are at the top, the leaders are at the bottom. The pur pur purpose of the leaders is to spend time serving the people. So it's not about, I'm the leader of a congregation, you need to follow me. It's about, I have been asked to be an extra servant to help you. That's true leadership. That's what it comes down to. That's what we need to be focusing on, especially if you are a leader in the church. That is the thing that you need to be paying attention to. How can we be better servants to those we are asked to work with? Okay, so important for us to think about. So that, again, this is flipping that power dynamic, real, realizing, guys, the kingdom of heaven is very different than the kingdom of world. So now, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So he's reminding them, I didn't come so that you can all worship me and empower me and take care of me. I'm here to even give my very life to serve you and everybody. So he's trying to help them think this through better. Now, verse 29, and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So this is on the way out. Now, what's interesting is Mark and Luke have different versions of this experience, basically. So we're going to see that when we get into the books of Mark and Luke. What are those differences that are in there? But there's, we, so we have to think about who's right. There's some contradictions in the Bible because Mark, Matthew, and Luke have some variations of this story. Just something to think about. Okay, so we'll talk more about that as we get into the other books as well. Now, verse 30, And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. So this is what's, this is, again, this is that idea of, the multitude, this group of people that is following Christ is like, Shh, shut up, you shouldn't be talking. They're using these, probably these, these two blind men are maybe a different race. Maybe they're a different part of the class system. They're this lower class people. 
They're seen as the poor. They're seen as different. They're seen as not as important as what Christ is doing. We're focusing on Christ is important. We got to do what he's doing. So we're going to push these people aside in the effort of, of focusing on taking care of Christ. But is that the right thing to do? It's not bad to focus on Christ. It's not bad to be there to support him and help him. But if we are pushing people away to focus on Christ, is that appropriate? Maybe that's not the right thing to do. So these two cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? So he stops and turns to them and says, Hey guys, what is it you want me to do for you? Verse 33, And they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. This is another great idea for leadership. Okay, Sometimes are we so focused on the goal we're going for? Are we so focused on the activity we're doing or the plan we're putting in place, the administrative stuff we're doing, that we forget that our job is to serve the people? Jesus stopped and took the time to ask these men, what is it that you'd like from me? I'm curious. I want to understand where you're coming from. Whereas the multitude took the perspective of, you don't fit in our plans, and therefore we are going to ignore you because we're focused on our plans. Christ stopped his plan of his journey to go to Jerusalem and said, what is it that you want? Let me understand where you're coming from here. And he wanted to help them. He had compassion on them. And he took the time to bless them. So as leaders in the church, when do we let policy and administration get in the way of helping other people? Maybe we should focus on helping. Because that's the point of the policy and the, the activities and the administration is helping people. Sometimes the administration gets in the way of helping people. And that is something we have to be really careful with when we do our thing or do things in the church. The leaders are there to serve. That's important. So some good concepts, good ideas for us to think about. Let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue forward.